Good morning, Gateway. Good to see you this morning. Worthy, come on. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever bring. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Only there is no one like you. There is none beside.
I will be reading from Psalms 119, verse 1. As soon as I get my glasses on, I'll be okay. <laughs> I'll read it. It's in English, I think. <clears throat> it says, Joyful are people of integrity who follow the instructions of the Lord. Joyful are those who obey his laws and search for him with all their hearts. They do not compromise with evil, and they walk in his paths. You are charged to keep your commandments carefully. Oh, that my actions would consistently reflect my decrees. Then I will not be ashamed when I compare my life with your commands. As I learn your righteousness, your righteous regulations, I will thank you by living as I should. I will obey your decrees. Please do not give up on me. Praise his holy name. As we do the next two worship songs, we'd just love to say thank you so much for allowing me to come out and lead worship for you this semester. What a blessing it's been for me. Thank you. is the battle come on you see my victory when all I see is the mountain you see mountain. and as I walk through the shadow your love surrounds Nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet, I sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And if you are for me, who can be against me? For Jesus is nothing impossible. When all I see are the ashes, you see the beauty. When all I see is the cross, God, you see the empty tomb. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet, I see through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Almighty oh, fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. An almighty fortress. And you go before us. And nothing can stand against the power of Shine in the shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of God. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Every fear I lay at your feet, I see through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs.
see you. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Can you put your hands together this morning? Come on. There you go. Love is mighty and so much stronger. The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the world with holy thunder? Leaves us breathless with horn and wonder. The King of glory, the King above all kings. Yeah. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You laid down your life. That I would be set free. done for me Who brings our chaos Come on Who brings our chaos back into order Who makes the orphan a son and daughter The King of glory The King of glory Who rules the nations with truth and justice shine like the say thank you to Reuben and the team for the semester's work they've done for us. Now I'd like to ask you to be seated for just a moment as we prepare to pray. A few days ago, I sent out a call to prayer to the seminary community for Allie Jones, uh, the daughter of Dr. And, uh, Jeff and Melissa Jones, who is struggling with a debilitating and at this point mysterious illness. Uh, both Jeff and Allie have given me clearance to say this to you publicly, and so I'm still calling you to pray uh, for this family. But I recognize as well today that during this season, there are others of you, either personally or people that you care deeply about, who are struggling with serious 
physical illness or other kind of uh, ailment. If you're in that situation today, that you have someone in your life or maybe even you that's really burdened about something that's going on in someone's health, would you just stand and we're going to pray for you right now. Let's just stand. Let's bow our heads together and pray for these that are standing. Heavenly Father, around this room are people who are either hurting physically or standing up in the place of someone who is. And right now we are heartbroken for Allie Jones and for others like her who are facing debilitating illnesses, cancers, ailments, Father, of various kinds, some mysterious many painful, all puzzling. Father, when Jesus walked the earth, he touched people and they were healed. We believe that power is still available today, so we ask you in the name of Jesus to touch these ailing persons and heal them by your power. Grant deliverance. Give healing. Restore health. And Father, for all of us who have the responsibility of caring for hurting people, give us grace, peace, compassion, and support as we do the work of giving that kind of care. And we thank you for hearing our prayer today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you. Be seated, those of you who were standing, and please open your Bibles with me to the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 27 where in just a moment I'll be reading a passage of Scripture that will be the foundation for today's message. In fact, reading quite a bit of Scripture that is the foundation for today's message. Before we do that, uh, just two or three short chapel announcements. First, graduation is coming in a few days. Pray for and look forward to that significant experience here on campus this time in the winter graduation. Today, we're hosting a significant luncheon for Hispanic ministry leaders at the, in the Grave Center at noon, and we welcome those of you who've come early to join us for chapel. And then also, remember the Bible teaching conference coming in January. We look forward to that every year as well. Today's chapel message is the final one in this series that we've been enjoying called From Calling to Commission the life of David from his selection until his coronation as king. We've learned a lot of different leadership principles from various speakers who've come our way. And now, uh, because of circumstances that we did not anticipate, I am your final chapel speaker for this series, and I'm glad to do so. We come now to the end of 1 Samuel to three significant chapters which which encapsulate a theme which I'll simply refer to as David fights many battles. And we see what we might learn from some simple observations about leadership based on these stories. Now, because these stories are probably not as familiar to you as perhaps some other parts of Scripture, I'm going to take time to read them this morning. And so join with me now as we start in 1 Samuel chapter 27 at verse 1 for these stories of David's many battles. David said to himself, one of these days, I'll be swept away by Saul. There is nothing better for me than to escape immediately to the land of the Philistines. Then Saul will give up searching for me everywhere in Israel, and I'll escape from him. So David set out with his 600 men and went over to Achish, son of Maok, the king of Gath. David and his men stayed with Achish in Gath. Each man had his family with him, and David had his two wives, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail of Carmel, Nabal's widow. When it was reported to Saul that David had fled to Gath, he no longer searched for him. Now David said to Achish, If I found favor with you, let me be given a place in one of the outlying towns so that I can live there. Why should your servant live in the royal city with you? That day, Achish gave Ziklag to David, and it still belongs to the kings of Judah today. The length of time that David stayed in Philistine territory amounted to a year and four months. David and his men went up and raided the Geshurites, the Gerzites, and the Amalekites. From ancient times, they had been the inhabitants of the region through Shur, as far as the land of Egypt. Whenever David attacked the land, he did not leave a single 
person alive. Either man or woman. But he took flocks, herds, donkeys, camels, and clothing. Then he came back to Achish, who inquired, Where'd you raid today? <laughs> David replied, The south country of Judah, the south country of the Jeromelites, or the south country of the Kenites. David did not let a man or woman live to be brought to Gath. For he said, Or they will inform on us and say, This is what David did. This was David's custom during the whole time he stayed in the Philistine territory. So Achish trusted David, thinking, since he has made himself repulsive to his people Israel, he'll be my servant forever. Chapter 28 is a digression from the life of David to the life of Saul, a fairly well-known story of Saul engaging the occult through the medium of Endor. We skip that story and pick up David's story again in verse 29. The Philistines brought all their military units together at Aphek while Israel was camped by the spring in Jezreel. As the Philistine leaders were passing in review with their units of hundreds and thousands, David and his men were passing in review behind them with Achish. Then the Philistine commanders asked, What are these Hebrews doing here? Achish answered the Philistine commanders, Well, that's David, servant of King Saul of Israel. He's been with me a considerable period of time. From the day he defected until today, I found no fault with him. The Philistine commanders, however, were enraged with Achish and told him, Send that man back and let him return to the place you assigned him. He must not go down with us into battle, only to become our adversary during the battle. What better way could he ingratiate himself with his master than with the heads of our men? Isn't this the David they sing about during their dances? Saul has killed his thousands, but David his ten thousands? So Achish summoned David and told him, Well, as the Lord lives, you're an honorable man. I think it's good to have you fighting in this unit with me because I have found no fault in you from the day you came to me until today. But, but the leaders don't think you're reliable. Now go back quietly and you won't do, be, any, be doing anything the Philistine leaders think is wrong. What have I done? David replied to Achish. From the first day I entered your service until today, what have you found against your servant to keep me from going to fight against the enemies of my lord the king? Achish answered David, I'm convinced that you are as reliable as an angel of God. But the Philistine commanders have said, he must not go into battle with us. So get up early in the morning, you and your master's servants who came with you. When you've all gotten up early, go as soon as it's light. So David and his men got up early in the morning to return to the land of the Philistines, and the Philistines went up to Jezreel. David and his men arrived in Ziklag on the third day. The Amalekites had raided the Negev and attacked and burned Ziklag. They had also kidnapped the women and everyone in it from the youngest to the oldest. They had killed no one, but had carried them off as they went on their way. When David and his men arrived at the town, they found it burned. Their wives, sons, and daughters had been kidnapped. <coughs> David and the troops with him wept loudly until they had no strength left to weep. David's two wives, Ahinoam, the Jezreelite, and Abigail, the widow of Nabal the Carmelite, had also been kidnapped. David was in an extremely difficult position because the troops talked about stoning him, for they were all very bitter over the loss of their sons and daughters. But David found strength in the Lord his God. David said to the priest, Abiathar, son of Ahimelech, bring me the ephod. So Abiathar brought it to him, and David asked the Lord, should I pursue these raiders? Will I overtake them? The Lord replied to him, pursue them, for you will certainly overtake them and rescue the people. 
So David and the 600 men went with him. They came to the Wadi Besor, where some stayed behind. David and 400 of the men continued the pursuit, while 200 men stopped because they were too exhausted to cross the Wadi Besor. David's men found an Egyptian in the open country and brought him to David. They gave him some bread to eat and water to drink. Then they gave him some pressed figs and two clusters of raisins. After he ate, he revived, for he hadn't eaten food or drunk water for three days and three nights. Then David said to him, Who do you belong to? Where are you from? I'm an Egyptian, a slave and a Malachite man, he said. My master abandoned me when I got sick three days ago. We raided the south country of the Carathites, the territory of Judah, and the south country of Caleb, and, and we, uh, uh, we burned Ziklag. David then asked him, Will you lead me to these raiders? He said, Swear to me by God that you won't kill me or turn me over to my master, and I'll lead you to them. So he led them, and there were the Amalekites spread out over the entire area, eating, drinking, and celebrating because of the great amount of plunder they had taken from the land of the Philistines and the land of Judah. David slaughtered them from twilight until the evening of the next day. None of them escaped except 400 young men who got on camels and fled. David recovered everything the Amalekites had taken. He also rescued his two wives. Nothing of theirs was missing from the youngest to the oldest, including the sons and daughters and all the plunder the Amalekites had taken. David got everything back. He took all the flocks and herds which were driven ahead of the other livestock, and the people shouted, This is David's plunder. When David came to the 200 men who had been too exhausted to go with him and had left at the, they had left at the Wadi Besor, they came out to meet him and to meet the troops with him. When David approached the men, he, gre he greeted them. But all the corrupt and worthless men among those who had gone uh, with David argued, Hey, because they didn't go with us, we will not give any of the plunder we recovered to them except for each man's wife and children. They may take them and go. But David said, My brothers, you must not do this with what the Lord has given us. He protected us and handed us over the raiders who came against us. Who can agree with your proposal? The share of the one who goes into battle is to be the same as the share of the one who remains with the supplies. They will share equally. And so it has been from that day forward. David established this policy as a law and an ordinance for Israel, and it still continues today. When David came to Ziklag, he sent some of the plunder to his friends, the elders of Judah, saying, Here's a gift for you from the plunder of the Lord's enemies. He sent gifts to those in Bethel, in Ramoth of the Negev, and in Jatir, to those in Aror, in Siphmoth, and in Eshtomoa, and to those in Rascal, in the towns of the Jeremalites, and in the towns of the Kenites, and to those in Hormah, in Borashan, and in Aktath, and to those in Hebron, and to those in all the places where David and his men had roamed. Do you agree that David fought many battles? And I want to be careful that we don't over-spiritualize these stories and first of all, understand them for what they were. This is a two-year description of a marauding band of warriors who practiced total war, destroying men, women, entire families, obliterating everything in their path. This was a brutal, even barbaric time to be alive. And yet, in the context of these stories, I believe we see emerging in David leadership principles and practices which are timeless and instructive for us even today. So let's very quickly and briefly, those are two liar's words for most preachers, see if I can highlight some of these principles this morning. First, I see in these stories that leaders stay on mission no matter how winding the path to fulfill it. David was worn down from fighting and fleeing Saul for these years. 
He starts in the beginning of chapter 27 by thinking to himself, I've got to get out of here. And so he took his family and his army and all of their families, which must have been two or 3,000 people, and moved them to another location to hide among the Philistines and escape this perpetual warfare with Saul. Now when he got there, he met up with this man, Achish, and he deceived him. He claimed to be raiding on his behalf, but when you study the detail of the story, you discover that David was actually attacking Judah's enemies, not the enemies of the Philistines. In other words, David was hiding from Saul among the Philistines and convincing the Philistines that he was fighting for them while at the same time doing what he was supposed to be doing, which was defending Judah and taking care of the mission that he was ultimately going to fulfill. All of that helps me to understand that leaders must stay on mission no matter how winding the path to fulfill it. We stay on mission by whatever means or method is required in the moment to get us to the right conclusion. Now, I don't want to go down the path today of trying to ferret out uh, the ethic of what we should do and when we shouldn't do it and what this whole thing related to the warfare and all of that. That's for another day. The broader picture is simply this. David found himself in a circumstance that he had to fulfill his mission, which was defending Judah and ultimately coming to be king over Israel, and yet doing that at the same time that he was trying to save his own life, save the life of his followers, find a place that they could have refuge for a while, convince that king that he was actually doing his bidding while he was really doing his own bidding, that is quite the work of a leader. Now, Different commentators say of David that he was politically shrewd, that he was legitimately conniving. I'm not even sure those words go together in a sentence, but apparently they do. But he, that he had a remarkable capacity to simply find a way to stay on track, even while he seemed to be off track in so many ways. Here's what I would say to us this morning. We have to know clearly what our mission is. And then, no matter what comes along that causes our path to wind along the way, we have to keep finding ways to fulfill that mission no matter the context, no matter the challenges, no matter the turns and twists the road may take. You know, this is one of the remarkable things about ministry leadership today. It isn't done in a straight line. You notice this? We tend to start out on a path, and we think we know where we're going, and pretty soon something comes along to divert us from one way or the other, whether it's a pandemic, whether it's a church conflict, whether it's a difficulty in a community, whether it's an unexpected illness in a family. Something comes up and keeps moving us off that straight path we laid out. The challenge of mission-driven leadership is to keep the mission in focus and to keep moving forward despite all these, what I would like to, so, what I might call this morning, so-called detours along the way. Mission-focused leadership. No matter how winding the path to fulfill it, no matter how uh, convoluted the processes may seem, always keeping that in mind. Second. The second thing I want to see in this, or I see in this passage is this. And that is that leaders stay focused on mission in the face of both external opposition and internal division. Now, the external opposition comes from these Philistine soldiers. In, that's all of chapter 29. David had been going out and fighting the enemies of Judah, convincing Achish he was actually fighting the Philistine enemies. The Philistines prepared for a larger battle and amassed themselves in battle array. And the Philistine uh, generals, and colonels, and commanders said to Achish, What's this guy doing here? He said, well, he fights with me. He said, no, 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 no. No, we're not doing this. We're not going into battle over here while he's in the back behind us because he can attack us from the rear. And what would please Saul more than anything would for him to take us captive or kill us and take our heads back, as the phrase said, take our heads back to, their, to his leader. We're not doing this. So David loses the privilege of 
maintaining his place in this Philistine community, if you will, by being forced to own up to, or not be, not, excuse me, by being forced by Achish to leave the battlefield and head back home to Ziklag. He's facing all kinds of external opposition now to his plan. Then he gets back to Ziklag, and disaster has occurred. While they were gone, the Amalekites came and destroyed everything. Now, the internal division that results is significant. What happens? Look at verse, or look in chapter 29, or verse chapter 30 with me. At the beginning, it says, when David, chapter 3, or verse 3, excuse me, when David and his men arrived, they found it burned. They wept loudly. Everything was gone. They were ready to kill David. So David is facing external conflict, and he's facing internal conflict. This defeat at Ziklag had created all kinds of chaos. Now, does this sound like us today? <laughs> does this sound like a typical church today, typical ministry organization today? It certainly sounds like our denomination today. It sounds like every place we, it seems like every place we turn, the Christian community is attacked internally. We're tearing each other apart because of internal conflict that we're having with each other. And then we're also faced with external conflict. Things that are happening outside of us are creating all kinds of difficulty, turmoil, and conflict for us. We have to stay on mission in the face of both external opposition and internal division. We're going to have to learn to stay on mission when facing external opposition more and more in our culture. One of the saddest weeks in American history has just transpired. The United States Senate ratifying same-sex marriage and making it the law nationally. That every marriage recognized in any jurisdiction will be legally binding in all jurisdictions. Do you understand what this is going to mean for the Christian church in the next 25 to 50 years? This is going to create incredible pressure on us in every way imaginable. Incredible external opposition. From our legal system, our political system, from our communities, and it's going to create incredible external opposition to us in every kind of way imaginable in terms of how we operate as a seminary, what we're legally able to do in our community, how we're able to make our facilities available or not available for community use, all kinds of issues in churches and schools and places of uh, our religious organizations are going to be faced with greater external opposition just on that one issue. That one issue is also going to create tremendous internal opposition and division in churches. I recently spoke on similar themes at a <clears throat> meeting in the, in the South. And when I finished speaking, uh, it was a larger meeting, several hundred people there, but when I finished speaking, uh, a gentleman came forward and waited to speak to me. And, you know, when you speak, you can tell people are waiting to speak to you. I mean, you just kind of get a sense, sense of it. This man was just kind of lingering, and I knew he wanted to talk to me, so I worked my way over to him. And he said, thank you for just a moment. I, I just needed a moment if I could. And I just want to describe him to you. He was probably about six feet two. He had white hair. He had an immaculately tailored suit. He looked like a, a, a judge or a banker stepping out of central casting from somewhere in the deep south. Are you getting a picture of what this man looks like in your mind? I mean, he was, he was just... Uh, a, a distinguished-looking gentleman, just a, a man of stature and, 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 and composure, waiting to talk to me. And this is what he said. He said, Dr. Orge, I've been a deacon in this church for more than 50 years. My granddaughter just introduced me to her wife. And then tears streamed down his cheeks, and he said, 
Dr. Orge, can you help me know how to relate to my granddaughter? Do you understand that that's what's going to be taking place in our churches, already is taking place, and is going to be taking place over the next decade or two as we start dealing with the internal challenges and divisions and turmoil, turmoil that this external pressure is going to bring upon us. That's an example of external and internal pressure. But there's also other kinds of internal division that alarms me today. You know, in churches, or Christian organizations, and denominations today, we seem intent on tearing each other apart from inside. We seem intent on attacking each other on lesser level issues, not core doctrinal things. I've been preaching for the last year and a half this message, this one message all over the country on Christian unity, and I've been preaching it, and everywhere I go I say the same thing. I've been in ministry now this month. I've been in ministry for 40 years. I took my first pastorate in December of 1982. I've never seen a time like we've had in the past two or three years, of internal conflict in churches. Never seen a time like this. And everywhere I go and preach this message, pastors come up to me by the droves and say, you have no idea what it's like at my church. It's worse than you even described. Dealing with internal conflict over issues. We're fighting and tearing each other apart over masks and mandates and over policies and procedures and over politics and candidates. We're destroying each other from within over these issues. Never seen anything like it. Now, David was facing external pressure, the Philistine army's questioning of his uh, presence and resistance of his being there now for a year and a half and wanting him out of their country. And then he gets home, Ziklag, and finds out everything's gone and his own people turn against him. Internal division. Listen, when faced... With external opposition and internal division, leaders must stay on mission. Clearly understanding what God has called us to do and determined to stay focused on that no matter what. Third, getting to the application, not the application, getting to the expression of how David stayed on mission. Third, the third principle that emerges from these battles is that when disaster looms, leaders Seek God. Look at verse 6 of chapter 30. David was in an extremely difficult position. I guess he was. Because the troops talked about stoning him. For they were all very bitter over the loss of their sons and daughters. And then this great phrase. But David found strength in the Lord his God. But David found strength in the Lord his God. And then David did a second thing. Not only did he find strength in the Lord his God, but he sought God's direction. Verse 7, David said to the priest Abiathar, son of Ahimelech, bring me the ephod. So Abiathar brought it to him, and David asked the Lord, should I pursue these raiders? Will I overtake them? David, when disaster loomed, David sought God's direction, and he sought God's direction in two ways. One, he personally found strength in the Lord his God. He turned internally to that connection that he had with God and found strength in that relationship. And then secondarily, he sought God's direction, or he asked God what to do. Some of the sweetest prayer times that I've had in my life have been when disaster was looming over me. It's an old joke, but it, it really has some truth in it. The pastor said to his parishioner, we need to pray about this. And the parishioner said, has it come to that? <laughs> you know, we find ourselves in those situations, don't we? Listen, I'll just tell you about one of those times. One of the most gut-wrenching, 
soul-searching, ego-stripping moments of prayer in my life was the night before I announced that we were selling the campus in Mill Valley, California and moving to Southern California. There was nowhere else to go, no one else to turn to. There was no one else to consult, no one who could help me. And that night, I was on my knees praying. And I can't tell you the exact words, but I can tell you some of them. I remember praying something like this. I said, God, if I'm about to make a cataclysmic mistake, And I really prayed these words. Then God, don't let me wake up in the morning. God, I need you. I'm desperate. I have no place else to go. There's no one else to turn to. No one else can help me. But tomorrow I've got to stand up and I've got to say what I really believe you're leading us to do. And if that's what you want, then wake me up in the morning and give me somehow the strength to stand up and do it. That's what I think it means when, David's, when the Bible says David found strength in the Lord his God. He got down on his knees and said, God, I've been trying to defend these people for years. I took them away and we hid out here with the Philistines for the past 18 months or so. I've been fighting this running, duplicitous battle with Achish, trying to convince him I was loyal, at the same time trying to fulfill my vision and mission of protecting Judah. We went down there to try to keep the ruse going with these Philistines, but those guys sniffed it out and sent me back home, and here I am. And we came home to this. Lord, the city is gone. Our kids are gone. Our wives are gone. Everything we own is burned up. I don't have no place else to go, God. I have to find strength in you, and I've got to get up off my knees and lead. So God, help me. Listen, if you haven't ever had to pray like that, you will someday. You can't be a Christian leader of any, of any significant responsibility and not come to the end of yourself fairly soon. The tasks are overwhelming. The challenges are too great. The, the external pressure is too much. The internal division's too real. And you may find yourself just like David, with your city burned down, your, your, your followers ready to stone you, your enemies at the gate. And in that moment, you will find strength in the Lord your God. The sweetest prayer times in my life, looking back over the past 40 years, have been those occasions when I was that desperate and found the strength that could only come from God. But then he did a second thing. He asked for God's direction, and God gave it. But I want you to notice how God gave him direction. The first one is obvious. The second one you likely missed. The first was obvious. They brought the ephod in. David prayed, and it says at the end of verse 7, the Lord replied to him, pursue them for you will certainly overtake them and rescue the people. I would very much like to know exactly how the Lord replied to David. But the Bible doesn't describe it. It only declares it. Somehow, God communicated the message to David, get up and go get them. Now, I think sometimes that happens today by we read a passage of Scripture and it becomes very real to us and we take it to be a personal instruction from God. Other times we simply feel a profound impression, a sense of God's direction or leading. And on a rare occasion, I, I've had it happen to me once, maybe twice in my life, I've actually felt like I heard God say to me, do this. But whatever... <coughs> pardon me, but by whatever means... The first instruction from David was apparently very direct. The Lord replied, <coughs> pursue them, for you will certainly overtake them. One way that God directs us when we seek Him, when we trust Him and seek Him, He directs us by giving us direct instruction. But now listen to the second way. The second way God responded to David about what he was supposed to do <laughs> was by sending him a half-dead Egyptian. 
Did you pick that up? I mean, David said, all right, fellas, let's go get them. And they said, all right. So they all got ready in battle array, and they all took out across the plains, and then someone realized, where in the heck are we going anyway? <laughs> where are these people we're supposed to be get, cap capturing? We, we can't find these Amalekites. And they found this half-dead Egyptian out there, hadn't eaten anything or drank anything for three days. And they picked him up and dragged him into camp, dropped him down in front of David. David said, who are you? He said, I'm a slave. My master dumped me because I got sick and couldn't keep up. He said, give this guy some water. Get some, get some fig paste and some grapes and get it in this boy and let's see if he's got any life left in him. He got this Egyptian halfway revived and David said, all right now, where'd your, where, where'd your uh, marauding band go when they dropped you off? Which way were they headed? And this Egyptian's come to his senses enough that he has a good sense to give an answer like this. I'm not telling you unless you make me some promises. <laughs> okay. But I'll tell you, if you'll promise you won't kill me when you get there, and also you won't turn me back over to the people who left me in the desert in the first place. David said, you have my word. He said, well, they went that way. Isn't that about how it happened? Now listen, God answers when you're in trouble and you cry out to him in two ways. God answers with direct messages, and God answers by arranging circumstances. God will send you a half-dead Egyptian to tell you which way to go. Let me tell you how this works out in our executive team here at Gateway. And the vice presidents are here this morning. They'll stand up and tell you, yep, that's what he says. A lot of times we'll get in meetings, a lot of times, almost every week it seems. We get in a meeting and we, we, we don't know what to do. We pray, we say, God, help us know what to do. We start every meeting praying. We pray, God, help us, show us what to do, give us wisdom, sh give us direction. And we bring the specifics before God. God, we got trouble about this. We don't know what to do about that. Help us with this. We start every meeting by praying and asking God for his help. And then we talk about what to do. And a lot of times I'll say something like this. Well, let's just see what God does about this. Or let's just see what happens next. Or let's just see what develops in this area. Let's see what happens. And it is uncanny how many times something comes along here at Gateway Seminary that none of us were anticipating or expecting, and there's the answer. For example, when we have job openings here at the seminary, we pray that God will bring us the right people. I have to tell you about most of the time, we're surprised at who shows up. <laughs> it's like, we had no idea that person would apply. We had no idea that person would be available. We didn't even know who that person was. And yet, by some circumstance, they come across our awareness, and they're the exact right person that we need. So when you're in trouble and you call out to God, ask him to speak to you, and then ask him to open your eyes for a half-dead Egyptian for a circumstantial, providential moment that he's going to bring something into your awareness that says this is the way you're supposed to go. Then finally, leaders promote unity when division emerges. Last thing. You know how the story unfolds. They got to the battle, and some fellows were too tired to go on. So verses 9 and 10 of chapter 30 tell us that they stayed behind. But the fighters wanted to keep fighting, and so they did. And then they came back, and verses 21, uh, verse 20 and 21, the 200 men, when they came back to the 200 men, the 400 who'd fought the battle said, we're not giving them a thing. They don't they deserve it. They didn't fight, they don't get the rewards. But in verses 23 to 25, David pled for unity. He said, brothers, we, we can't do this. But here's the basis of his unity. He said, we must not do this with what the Lord has given us. He protected us and handed, us, handed over to us the raiders who came against us. Now listen. David pled for unity based on God's blessing and provision as their source. And I will say it this way. We will share resources when we recognize God as our source. And we will promote unity when we prioritize the corporate good over personal gain. Now listen. In Gateway Seminary, in your church, in our denomination... Not everyone is every day putting out an equal effort. It's just not going to happen. There's days when some of us are sick, some of us feel bad, some of us are distracted. There's other days when others of us are working hard, focused, determined, committed. Same thing in your church. 
And if you allow people to lapse into the belief that ultimately everything good happens because of someone's self-effort, then you're headed toward division. But if you can stay focused like David, whatever we have is a result of God's blessing of us. It will help you to focus on unity and all staying together. He's here today, and I don't want to embarrass him, but I'm going to talk about my pastor for just a minute. A couple of years ago in a meeting, my pastor, Dr. Brian Kennedy, challenged our church, Mount Zion, to become a much more multicultural congregation. Now, our church is not opposed to this, but it's a big change for our church. And so we're taking it step by step as we work toward that goal. Pastor Kennedy made this great statement in a meeting. He said, this is where we're going. Now watch me. This is where we're going, and we're taking everyone with us. If you're on a walker, he said, if you're on a walker, you come as fast as you can, but we'll wait on you because we're all going forward together. And I thought, what a beautiful picture of pastoral leadership saying, we're going forward. We see our mission clearly. We're going to become different than we are. But we're going to go forward together. And as long as you're trying to go with us, even if you're on a walker and you're coming slow, we're going to wait for you. We're going to help you. We're going to carry you. We're going to get you there. As long as you're trying to go with us, we're all going to go together. David said to his followers, God has prospered us. And yeah, there were some of us who couldn't go to battle that day, but they've gone to battle with us a lot of other days. Just today they couldn't, but God prospered us, and now we're all going forward together because this is God's business, not just ours. Well, these are some reflections on David fighting many battles. We stay on mission no matter how winding the path. We stay on mission no matter the external and internal confusion. We seek God when disaster looms in the pursuit of our mission, and we promote unity. We promote unity because we believe God is the source of our prosperity and progress. Thank you for being here this chapel series. Uh, we are going to not do a series of chapel messages like this in the spring because we have so many special guest speakers that it was just not really practical to work it out. But thank you for being here this semester, and thank you for uh, working through these stories of David, his life, his ministry, and his preparation from the time he was called till the time he was coronated or commissioned to be king. Thank you for being here this semester and for what you've, uh, what you've contributed to our chapel experience. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for what you've done in our lives this semester, studying the life of David. And I pray, Father, based on what we've learned today, that as we're fighting many battles, maybe not as bloody or as gory or as difficult as what he lived through, but as we're trying to ferret out some principles from his life that make a difference in ours, that you'll help us to stay on mission no matter the winding road we may find ourselves. And that you will also help us, Father, to resist both external pressures and internal divisions, to work hard, Father, at seeking you and hearing from you and looking for the direction you provide us, and then doing all we can to foster unity. Lord, there's so much brokenness in our churches and organizations and denomination today. I pray that as believers, you would give us a heart to promote unity and recognize that our prosperity and blessing comes from you and that we can all go forward together. Give us that peace and patience with one another. And thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.